Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wi-Fi Now TV in association with RCR Wireless News. My name is Klaus Hetting, and I'm your host. On today's show, celebrating 25 years of IEEE 802.11, we've got working group chairman, sorry, yes, working group chairman, uh, Dr. Adrian uh, Stevens with us. We're going to talk to him in just a second. Also, from the U.S., uh, CEO of Front Porch, Zach Britton is here. We're going to ask him how to monetize Wi-Fi with intelligent consumer engagement. Join us right after this message. Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board. Telecomcareers.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. We've got a great show and a great happening today because I don't know how many of you out there actually know that this exact date, September 10th, is the 25th anniversary of IEEE 802.11. We're going to talk to Adrian Stevens, the current working group chair, in just a moment. A little bit later in the program, uh, a hot is issue in the Wi-Fi industry, how to monetize Wi-Fi. We've got a super expert on the issue, uh, Zach Britton from Front Porch here is going to tell us all about it. He's also going to show us a small demonstration. So before I do that, however, I've got to do my usual uh, self-promoting plug because we've got Wi-Fi now, the conference coming up in Amsterdam this fall. Europe to check it out. We've got a great program. Actually, Zach Britton is going to be there. You get to meet him in person as well uh, this fall in Amsterdam. Also, we've got a quiz happening at Wi-Fi now. We want to have a little bit of fun and try to test your knowledge of Wi-Fi technology, standards, history, all of that. It's about 20 some questions. You can find it if you go to our Twitter handle at Wi-Fi Now Events. Find, uh, check it out there on Twitter. Have some fun with it. You can win fabulous prizes, of course, as well, including a gold pass to our Amsterdam conference. It's actually quite hard, okay? But it's fun to do and try out. All right, everybody. Uh, before we bring on Dr. Adrian, I just want to give you the latest stats on how Wi-Fi is doing uh, across the world. I lifted these numbers off the Wi-Fi Alliance website and they are truly remarkable. 2.3 billion devices today. It's forecasted to reach 4 billion Wi-Fi enabled devices by 2020. We've got 22,000 products certified by the Wi-Fi Alliance. And actually just today, uh, chip maker Quantena announced the, uh, the first AC, 802.11 AC Wave 3 chipset, which does peak rates of 10 gigabits per second using 8 by 8 by Take that 5G people out there. We've got gigabit technology right now in, in the Wi-Fi industry. So we're delighted about that. Also, here's a little bit uh, of the, well, kind of the alphabet soup of 802.11. Here is a list that I picked off Wikipedia, actually of all the standards that have happened since the beginning, I might actually miss out a few. So it's 802.11, A, B, G, N, A, C, A, D, A, F, A, H, A, I, A, J, A, Q, A, X, and A, Y. Actually, we covered, by the way, A, I, on a previous show uh, with Vivek Ganti from Cable Lab. So we're trying to uh, work our way through uh, certainly the recent standards, but um, more about that also in coming shows. I'd like to bring on Dr. Adrian Stevens, uh, and he's coming to us live from Bangkok. Dr. Stevens, welcome to Wi-Fi Now. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. Thanks very much for coming on, uh, Adrian. And today we can, we can confidently say that Wi-Fi is in every pocket, it's in every home. It's in practically every connected device, and it has, uh, in practice, transformed the way we live our lives, really. Uh, I think even more so than what mobile did, perhaps, in, in the late 90s. How does it feel to be a part of that worldwide transformation? Because you played really and continue to play an important role in all of that. 
it, it's tremendously satisfying. Um, as an engineer, you want to make things that people want to use. And uh, 23 years ago, I was recruited to a job and it was sold to me on the basis of, well, you haven't heard of this thing called 82.11. Um, we don't know how important it will be in the marketplace. Uh, please come and write us a software stack. And looking back on that time, you could see that it's just had a huge effect on people. Uh, when you go, when you choose a hotel, you make sure that you've got Wi-Fi. Um, People expect it as a kind of right, and people feel deprived if they haven't got their uh, data fix. And um, also, the majority of data today from mobile devices travels over S2.11 technologies. So um, it, it's just tremendously satisfying to be part of that and to, to know that you're working on technology that is having a positive impact on people's ability to communicate and interact. Right, so for all of you who've been working in the working groups for a long time, when did you realize, at what point did you realize that this was gonna be such a resounding success? Yeah, it, it's hard to quantify because it, it, it happens gradually. You look back on it. Um, it in my, my mind, recognition of the Wi-Fi brand. And uh, of course, I got to say Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi Alliance and Dot11 are two organizations. Dot11 writes the technical specs. Um, I view the Wi-Fi Alliance as providing marketing and certification. And each is mutually dependent on the other. Um, but the, the brand is now recognized by most people on this planet. You know it's a success when you hear jokes being made about it. Right, absolutely. And, and so in your day-to-day -day life, I'm just curious because I've, I've never sat on any working group body of any kind. I follow the standards, but I don't work with them. In your day-to-day -day life, what's the most fun part of uh, of the work that you do. I imagine there's a, it's a huge task of documenting and organizing and so on and so forth. There are, a whole, there are lots of different aspects to it. I mean, we, we're fundamentally all nerdy engineers, but we have to learn how to work within a, a tremendously uh, organized uh, consensual process defined by the IEEESA. And also we're fundamentally competitors. So I work for a company, Intel. Uh, there are people who work for other companies. From the IEEE's point of view, we're volunteers. But of course, our employers are paying us money to come to these meetings. Um, so how do natural competitors um, work together to achieve something that has value to all of them. And really what we're about is we're about creating a bigger market because standards enable markets. You know, you could almost say that any individual company could probably write a spec of similar uh, capability to dot 11, but it would just be a personal standard it wouldn't be, sorry, a personal specification, it wouldn't be a standard. And the standard then me means that people can be confident, you grow ecosystems, and people do cool and crazy things uh, with the technology that you've created. Right, exactly. So so what do you see as the, the biggest success story of 802.11? I kind of think of it as uh, as around about the time when the N standard came out, but I don't know if you agree with that. That seems to have changed a lot, it changed a lot of things in the industry. Certainly at each of the major steps, there's been an increasing dependence on the technology. Um, I think G was important N. Um, suddenly people's links were a lot more reliable. I don't know if you noticed that if you went from G to N, you probably got increased range. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yep, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, very good. So, so how do you view the future of Wi-Fi? There's a tremendous amount of momentum right now. Also, of course, with AC, I just mentioned that uh, chipset manufacturer just came out with uh, what appears to be the first uh, AC Wave 3 product. Um, so wh what's the future and how do we keep the momentum going as far as your standardization work is concerned? 
we're moving in a number of different directions. Um, we have multiple projects on the go at the same time. So AX, you might want to talk about that in a minute, is uh, addressing um, higher efficiency and more dense applications. But we've also had uh, S2.11AD, which is 60 gigahertz technology. That's starting to become um, available. Um, it's a more expensive technology, so you've got to wait for that kind of volume uh, driving down costs, decreased costs driving up volume. We we haven't yet hit that virtuous cycle, but we will. Uh, but there's also an aspect that um, different frequencies have an effect on things like spatial reuse. So how many of these things you can cram together? And if you believe people's predictions about uh, the demand for data increasing factors of a thousand over the next 10 years or whatever, you know, we've got our work cut out and we've got to exploit all these different technologies. Right, absolutely. And you did mention AX and I know it's still early days for AX and we're just right now starting to get into wave three AC. Uh, can you share with us a little bit of the status on AX and when we might uh, yes yeah, yeah, so, uh, finish that. So we're, we're now into what is probably the most fun part of writing a standard. When um, people uh, who, who understand what they're talking about get together in, I was going to say darkened rooms, but that's not true. They're, they're well lit, perhaps over air conditioned. And they just thresh out, um, okay, should we do it like this? Should we do it like that? What happens if we've got extra bits here? Do we care more about reliability or range? So that we're, we're going through that creative process at this very moment. And then once we've done that creative high level uh, design, we'll then go into more of the detailed design, start writing uh, the documents. So then we go through a polishing phase over a period. We could probably see, um, a fairly stable draft um, in 2018, middle of 2018. That's right. my guess. But mm -hmm. you know, how long is a piece of string? Uh, it depends on us all <laughs> uh, working together collaboratively. And right. uh, it, also, AX is more complex than AC because we're trying. You you you've got to add complexity to solve a harder problem. AX is trying to solve a harder problem. So it may take us a little longer to get there. And part of the complexity, as I understand it, is to include, include a form of scheduler uh, into the technology that, and that's a big departure from, from what has been done in the past. Is that correct? Or? Yes. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, AX will add is the uplink multi-user MIMO. So, so what that means is an access point uh, coordinates a whole bunch of stations and says, OK, you can all speak now. And they all speak at exactly the same time. So you might get four or eight stations speaking at the same time. And then the access point has to pull apart those multiple uh, threads it's hearing. Uh, we, the reason we do this very complex thing is that it enables multiple stations to transmit at the same time. You've got higher aggregate throughput. The individual stations don't see a benefit, but the total aggregate throughput at the access point is increased by a factor of several. Yeah, super uh, excellent advancement is in the performance. I wanted to ask you about the speed at which uh, the IEEE uh, 802.11 working group has actually been proceeding because um, typically if you compare, for example, to the mobile industry, it takes six years or eight years to complete a standard. And you guys actually do it much, much faster than that. And, and poss that's possibly one of the reasons for the success of Wi-Fi. How do you manage to do that? It, it's, um, it, it's by having a process. So the IEEE has a process um, that is consensual. And the people who come along to the meetings have done it all before. Uh, they're all pretty senior. And we just follow the routine with a a new um, physical layer, you've got to work on channel modeling, you 
you create requirement specifications, you identify use cases, you define simulation scenarios, you go through this, um, it's, there's no magic there, it's just an engineering process of doing the next thing you, you've, you know you've got to do. And mm -hmm. if you stay to the bitter end, uh, at the bitter end, you're arguing about whether a comma should be here or not a comma should be here. You know, so we start with the really big ideas and we end up polishing and some people can't stand it to the end and they leave. But, and some people like me are so detail oriented, we care about the commas. Well, thank goodness for that. And, and we really appreciate all the comments you're putting in there to make these keep evolving these standards to, to, to meet the demand out there. And there's lots of demand still to be satisfied out there. What do you think? Well, actually, I want to ask you first, if you could have um, done something differently, perhaps, I and mean, it's, it's a little bit of a negative question, but is there anything you would have liked to done, have done differently in the standardization work that you're doing? I don't think we've had any disasters. We've had some good punch-ups, well, virtual punch-ups. Uh, the 11G process was interesting. Um, 11N was interesting. You know, there was a bit of contention there. We learned from 11N about how to be more collaborative, which is why 11AC came out a lot faster than 11N. Uh, so perhaps if we'd been more collaborative during 11N, it might have been out uh, a year earlier. Um, Perhaps TV white space, we might have started that too early because the regulations were changing throughout that entire time. And even now, there's arguably no current market for TV white space devices. Right. So absolutely. And, and um, we're following that very closely, by the way, and I, we could probably spend an entire program on that. Maybe we'll ask, ask you to come back. Um, so... Uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge, uh, perhaps, uh, from your point of view, I guess, technical challenge right now for the Wi-Fi industry as such? I mean, we're doing so well that maybe it was, you know, it's, it's not an appropriate question to ask, but please have a go. Well, yes, we're, we're all tremendously successful. We're making money from it. Um, our users are happy with what we've got. Uh, but if you take that factor of a 1,000 throughput uh, improvement in a few years time. Um, that's a really big scary thing. Uh, how, how do we actually satisfy that? We think there are engineering solutions. So for instance, AD, which is a radio at 60 gigahertz and the follows on from that will increase spatial reuse. So we have ways of achieving it, but it's a bit scary thinking that you're going to need to actually find those answers and create those products in uh, a few years time well it's fantastic to have you on the show i just want to ask you one last question dr adrian Stevens, and that's if you could have anything in the world that would further the wi-fi industry what would you like to see um i think i would wave a magic wand and create more spectrum because that's the cheapest way of increasing throughput but unfortunately in the real world that doesn't happen. We just have to work smarter at using the, the spectrum we've got. So well, actually, that's the answer. We want to be smarter. Okay, very good. That's an excellent answer. I wish I could wave that magic wand as well. I think that I, I hope there's a lot of people working on making that happen out there so that we can get more spectrum for more Wi-Fi. Great to have you on the show and we want you to come back. So uh, please stay in touch. Thank you so much. For, Thank you, Klaus. I've yeah. really enjoyed this. And a well, great and happy anniversary to you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks to Adrian Stevens from the IEEE Work Group and 802.11, I should say. All right. Our next guest, I'm delighted to introduce. His name is Zach Britton. He's the CEO and, co and founder, I should say, of uh, California-based Front Porch and Zach at Front Porch has been doing some uh, extremely good work on cracking one of the biggest challenges in the Wi Fi industry that I know of, and that's monetizing Wi Fi. Zach, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Klaus. Great to have you. So, Zach, can you tell us a little bit for the viewers that are not familiar with Front Porch, a little bit about the company and what you do? Certainly. So Front Porch has been around since 1998. We've worked with a lot of the largest carrier Wi-Fi initiatives here in the U.S. Uh, the Cable Wi-Fi Consortium uses our messaging platform 
to make sure they get the right message to the right user at the right time. We have uh, customers also in Europe and Asia who use our platform. Sometimes the messaging platform is used for communication of, of upselling new connectivity packages, app downloads, that sort of thing. And other times with third-party advertising, sponsorship, depending upon if it's a free Wi-Fi network or if it's a carrier Wi-Fi network, we see some different models in different places being used. Right. So you, uh, and you just mentioned that you're actually supplying your technology to uh, some of the biggest uh, Wi-Fi carriers out there, including, I don't know if it's everybody in the Cable Wi-Fi Alliance, but it's certainly TWC, Cox, Comcast. Um, can you share with us uh, the secret, if you like, of Wi-Fi monetization for carriers like that? Well, the model that's, that's the reason there's Wi-Fi and carrier Wi-Fi in particular in the U.S. has been largely used to reduce turn. So the more that you make, the more amenities you can add to your package for all your users, the less likely they're going to look for somebody else to give them uh, their bandwidth. So the first and foremost reason is to provide a really good user experience with Wi-Fi. One of our customers, for example, here in the States, they, do, they war drive and they make sure that their Wi-Fi is three times as fast as any mobile alternative in any one location. So they make sure that they have a lot of Wi-Fi bandwidth everywhere. It's great coverage. So that's that's really w what they're building this for. And there's other, other models in other countries and in other regions. So monetization tends to be a secondary issue, but it's a really nice icing on the cake if you can make it work. And so the different things we see happen Oftentimes, you'll see a, a bifurcation. Someone logs on. I'll give you one example of one network. Uh, this actually is a, a European network. So people log on, and they have a choice. Do they want to get free Wi-Fi with ads supported, or do they want to play, I think it's one euro an hour, or do they have a roaming arrangement with one of the other carriers? So they get an alternative. In that particular network, I think the statistic is 94% choose the ad support. So they, they get an advertisement that allows them, they'll see, I think they get a video roll every 15 minutes or something like that. So see a video, then they uh, free internet access, then another video and free internet access, something akin to the television model. Right, so you're well known for, for ad injection technology, right, into the browser. But what you're mentioning here is actually that you're, you're basically delivering the entire user experience from, from the point at which the person logs on, selects the service that he wants. And then once you, that person is past that, you can still presumably communicate with that user uh, through the browser, right, with ad injection. Is that how it works? Exactly. And, and I would say that the advertising component is a smaller component that are, as we've done this, we've been doing this for quite a long time. And the highest value ad is a first party so if you can promote your own products and services, if you have, the average carrier may have, I don't know, five, 10, 15 apps, may not get a lot of people downloading them, may not get a lot of usage on them. We've had a lot of success promoting apps through this little, the, the, the overlay that comes into the screen. And we see that that's, that's the highest, you can increase your ARPU that way. The third party advertising does work, but it's the messaging overall, making sure the consumer is, is onboarded, gets a good experience, has alternatives that apply, that are, applicable to them in the context that they're surfing. It's the overall user experience. Right, exactly. And and maybe we can show, I know Zach uh, uh, sent us a video that, that we can show uh, uh, to show people a little, little bit about what uh, Front Porch is enabling here in terms of the user experience. I think the example is from, the example is from uh, an NFL stadium, is it? Is that correct? It's, it's a venue here in the US, yes. Yeah, okay. And, um, can we run the video and then maybe Zach can roughly tell us, uh, you're not gonna be able to see it Zach because it's just a part of our technical side of it, but maybe you can roughly tell us what's going on in the video. I'll imagine it, you bet. Okay. Go ahead so and again, Yeah. So the video is uh, basically shows a user surfing, uh, they're surfing on their phone. And as they're surfing, a little icon slides up from the Coliseum. Let's say they're at, at a stadium, they're watching a game and they have these options, they can see they can get more information from the Coliseum itself, maybe get a download of an app that applies to that Coliseum or that venue, or they can choose another option, which is to get an app for the team that's playing at that time, or another option, let's buy some products and services, or yet another option would be to buy some food and food services at that Coliseum. The idea is to have an in-app ex app experience without actually having to download an app. So through the web browser, we're able to 
make the user, no matter where they're sitting, what device they're using, Android, Google, et cetera, uh, Android or, or Apple, or et cetera, they'll all get the same web app and get the same experience. And you'll be able to communicate with everyone who comes on your premise. That's, that's the basic right, exactly. concept. That, that's the concept. And, and is, there a, is there any sort of major difference between the types of venues that you serve? For example, I presume, I mean, this is a, this is a sports type uh, uh, venue. And for, um, for the mobile, sorry, for the cable carriers out there, their Wi-Fi, uh, or is it more or less the same thing? And, and what are the models involved? Well, the, the, the basic premise that you want to make sure you have a good user experience is the, is the commonality, but there's very different ways of implementing. So if you have a chain of, of fast food stores, let's say you're a, a McDonald's, a Burger King, a Wendy's, whatever it might be, your goal is to get people in there and you want to upsell something. You want to make sure that they, instead of just buying a, a drink, they get a supersized drink, that sort of thing. So you can make promotions while they're on premise and make sure they buy more. Other folks just want people to stay longer. The longer you have people's dwell time, the longer they stay, the more coffee they drink, that sort of thing. So there's different, different types of ways of promoting products and services depending upon the venue and what they're trying to accomplish. And, and I remember when we spoke at the Mobile World Congress earlier this year, you mentioned various models. You also mentioned actually onboarding. And I kind of like that idea that, for example, a, a carrier can go out and give away free Wi-Fi and, and possibly get another marketing channel or an onboarding channel through through doing that. That's one of our favorite use cases. You, you have this great Wi-Fi, you've rolled it out everywhere. Your users, your, your current users are, are, are getting Wi-Fi everywhere they go in your coverage area. But all the transients, all the folks who aren't your current customers, they're coming on. What sort of experience can you give them that brings them into your overall fold? And then your ARPU just goes through the roof. That's the, one of the highest returns on investment right there. Right. So Zach, tell us, how do you see the future of the, if you like, the public Wi-Fi movement? We're, we're seeing a lot of activity, especially in the United States. It has been uh, accelerating, I think, over the last year or two. What do you see? Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen over the next year? Or two? <laughs> if I knew that, I'd make a lot of money on the stock market. But <laughs> I, I think... I think that, that we that something you mentioned at the very beginning of this program, that there's already over 2 billion devices, it's increasing to over 4 billion in, in just a few years. We're going to see more users with more devices, connecting more places, needing more bandwidth, using business cases we haven't maybe even come up with yet. So I think that the sheer cacophony of the marketplace is one of the biggest challenges for us as, as, as uh, folks who are trying to provide these services. And I think that in, in some markets, you see one or two carriers have really invested a lot already in Wi-Fi. They've got a, a first mover advantage. I think that there's going to be a lot of follow-up. That you, You're going to see a lot of overlaying, overlapping Wi-Fi networks all over the place. And you're going to see a lot more, I think, roaming arrangements where suddenly someone who is in Denmark and he's traveling to Spain and then traveling somewhere else, they're going to get a seamless experience everywhere they work. I mean, that's what Hotspot 2.0 is about. And I think that that is going to make it really possible to do a lot more over the top type projects and, and, and services for, for users. Fantastic. And we really want to thank you to, for coming on the show. And we also are really looking forward to hosting you at our Wi-Fi Now conference in Amsterdam, where you're going to be on one of the panels. And if you don't know Zach, uh, come to Amsterdam and meet him. He's, a, he, he's obviously super insightful about monetization and, and uh, Wi-Fi technology. So, uh, Please don't miss that. Zach, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Klaus. Good to be here. All right, everybody. That's uh, this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, all there is for me to say is to just to give you a little bit of a heads up for what's happening on next week's show. Next week, we're going to be talking about carrier grade Wi-Fi with a very good friend of mine. His name is Sami Susiaho. He is the head of edge technologies at Sky and uh, he's essentially managing the cloud, the big uh, Wi-Fi service provider in the UK. We're gonna to talk to him about carrier grade Wi-Fi, so don't miss that. Also, we'll be speaking to Amir Rajwani of Texas-based Spectrumax about Wi-Fi calling and messaging for carriers. They have a totally fresh approach to that, and Amir is gonna tell us all about that on next week's show. It's been delightful to have all of you watching today, don't miss next week's episode, uh, episode seven, I think it is, 
uh, same place, same time right here on RCR Wireless News. Thanks, everybody, and join me next week. Wi-Fi Now is a production of RCR TV News. To suggest a show topic or to learn more about Wi-Fi Now events, you can reach Klaus Heading at klaus at headingconsulting.com. To find out more about Wi-Fi Now and all things wireless, visit rcrwireless.com.